Welcome to First Presbyterian Church here on this Ash Wednesday. We're so glad that you can join us. Be prepared here. Prepare a worshipful space for you wherever you are. Bring in a Bible, a candle, maybe something to drink. But we'll also be doing two things during the service. We'll be doing communion, so have some bread and some wine or some juice available to join in as we do communion by intinction. And also we're going to do the imposition of ashes. Now I realize you probably don't have ashes at home, but maybe get some oil in a little bowl and you could use the oil to mark each other's foreheads or your own if you're by yourself. So please gather those things together and come and join as we enter into this worship on the beginning of Lent, the first day of our journey with Christ towards Jerusalem. And so now I invite you, I invite you to relax, to slow down, to enter into a more calm perspective. Because it is evening. And in biblical times, we would all be securely at home, probably in our beds. The day would be over until tomorrow's light illuminated the horizons. But in our world of electronic lights, of nonstop entertainment from cable and the internet, we extend our days, staying busy until late, maybe just even minutes before slipping into bed. But now, settle down. Calm your breathing. Eliminate any distractions that may be taking place. Let the ever-present sense of busyness slide away. Let us become present to our surroundings. Let us become present to what is going on within us. And let us be present to the Holy Spirit surrounding us all. Let us be present to the quiet voice of God speaking to us. And let us be calm, but present. Calm, but alert to what God is working in our midst this very moment. So let's come to worship. Let us pray. God, our Father, as we begin this holy season of Lent, Help us to see that your merciful love is with us always, even when we have wandered far from you. We ask you to change our hearts that we might become better followers of your Son, Jesus Christ. With the help of your grace, may our prayers and sacrifices over the next 40 days lead us to welcome him, Jesus Christ, and see him in each other, in the poor, in the sick, and in the lonely, so that all together we can greet him as one family at Easter. We make this prayer to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Join me now for our prayer for illumination. Lord, the days run together, and our ability to discern your voice through all the world's noise grows difficult. Recognizing that you still speak, no less than you did to Moses or Mary, we ask you to send your spirit that we might hear the word you have for us this day, this season. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our reading comes to us from the book of Joel, chapter 2. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy hill. Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. Like dawn spreading across the mountains, a large and mighty army comes, such as never was of old, nor ever will be in ages to come. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings, for the Lord your God. Our gospel reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the sixth chapter. And this is Jesus speaking, Jesus teaching us. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men, to be seen by them. If you do, you'll have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets, as the hypocrites do in synagogues and on the streets. To be honored by men, I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be secret. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face, so that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your Father, who is unseen. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. Our Joel reading today opens with some foreboding language. We're told to tremble, to sound the alarm, to be prepared for darkness, for gloom, for blackness. It is relentless, like the onslaught of a large army, a mighty army, coming over the fields towards us. We're told that the day of the Lord is coming. Now, in the Old Testament, the day of the Lord refers to some very significant event, either a current event, like in this case, the fact that just before this, we hear about the invasion of locusts, or some future event, like later in the Old Testament, the destruction of Jerusalem. But the day of the Lord 
no matter if it's talking about a current event or something that will happen in the future, also foreshadows the end times, the final day of the Lord, the last judgment on all evil and sin. So though Joel hasn't explicitly stated it up to this point, it is clear that this calamity of the day of the Lord has been brought on by the Israelites' failings and sin. So he's telling us, get ready, we're going to get it with both barrels. And then the scene shifts amazingly. We hear from the Lord, we hear from God, a calmer, non-threatening, and encouraging voice. He says, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning, Rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and relents from sending calamity. And then Joel adds, who knows? He might turn and have pity and leave behind a blessing. So this is quite a juxtaposition here in Joel from an unavoidable doom to God calling us to him, led by love and compassion. You may have heard this analogy before of God like a grandmother with several grandchildren around her, one of whom is unruly. And rather than punishing the unruly one, of putting him in time out, of separating him away from the other children, the grandmother sitting on a bench makes a little room next to her and draws the child close to her, saying, here, sit next to me. And she places her arm around the troublemaker and she inquires, what is wrong? What is bothering the child? The grandmother is essentially calling the child to return, to return to his or her true self, to put away this falseness. And God is calling us to come back, to return home with all your heart, with all the joy, all the love, and all the pain, and all the insecurity, and all the hate. In spite of what you've done, bring it all and sit on this bench here next to me. Rend your heart. Ring out those things that don't belong there, like hate, and violence, and oppression, and dominance, and self-centeredness, and self-glorification, and uh, enlarged ego. The God is saying, talk to me. Tell me about the things you've done, and let tears flow over the wrong you've done to others, and the wrong you've done to me. Return to me, and my heralded wrath will turn into blessings. And then in Matthew, we hear from Jesus. Jesus teaching us how to behave. Now, just in case there's any confusion, being a hypocrite is not a good thing, right? It is downright bad. Three times Jesus tells us not to be a hypocrite in this reading. And in saying what to avoid to how not to be a hypocrite, Jesus paints a pretty clear picture of who the hypocrites are. And in short, they are ones seeking self-glorification, not the glory of God. We're told to go about doing the good that we do without others noticing, even without us noticing what we're doing. Because if others notice, Jesus says, That is our reward. The good impression that we've made upon others, that is our reward. And we miss out on the reward that God has for us. And these earthly rewards are troublesome, aren't they? They rot. They slip away. They get stolen. The good impression we made upon someone today may fade tomorrow when we do something else. And then, that line that we've heard so often, for wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. 
If our treasure is our own glorification in any number of ways or facets, then our heart is there on us, on our glorification. Which means it is not with Christ. It is not with God. It is not with the kingdom. It is not with the others in this world. And so here at Ash Wednesday, we're at the beginning of Lent. Now, Lent is a journey. It is a journey with Christ to learn. And given that today is Ash Wednesday, there is another tradition called Fat Tuesday that you may have participated in yesterday. Because there's a tradition of giving something up for Lent, of denying ourselves something during Lent. And Fat Tuesday, ironically, has been a day of indulging in whatever it is we're about ready to give up. Seems kind of contradictory, but it's kind of like building up for not being able to do it or have it for the next 40 days. But if we choose this path, this path of giving something up or of denying ourselves something during Lent, this denial should be for the sake of coming closer to Christ. This denial should be for removing something that stands in the way of our relationship with Christ. And Christ tells us it should be unseen, whatever it is we're doing. We're not trying to press anyone, including ourselves, with our willpower or our sacrifice or our piety. Now, Transfiguration Sunday was just last Sunday. It always comes just before Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. And in that Transfiguration, God speaks from the cloud and says, This is my son, who I am well pleased. Listen to him. And listen to him is an apt preparation for Lent, of listening and being formed by Jesus as we travel these 40 days. So during these 40 days, let us not just be seen with Christ to say, Yeah, we were there. No. As we walk closely with Christ, let us listen closely to what he says. Even those things he says that we may not want to hear, like love your enemies. Or listen closely to his actual words that society has attempted to soften and sanitize and transform them into meaning something different than what Christ meant when he said them. Let us listen To him, listen to Christ. Let us watch him, listen to his teachings, watch his actions. So let us journey with Christ. And as God states, bring our hearts with all they contain, the good and the unkind, with him. As we walk with Christ and learn from his teachings and actions, let us rend our hearts wringing out all that does not belong there, and let our heart and treasures be focused on Christ, be focused on God, be focused on what Christ calls us to do, be focused on following God's will, and focused on God's kingdom that is breaking upon us if we look with Christ's eyes to see. Amen. And this is Ash Wednesday, and we engage in the imposition of ashes. Now, I realize you probably don't have ashes at home, so feel free to get some olive oil or any other thing that you want to dip your finger in to mark yours and or people you're with's foreheads. I will go first in doing this with Diana, and then we'll invite you to join in as Diana reciprocates and does it to me. And Ash Wednesday is a reminder of our sinfulness. It's a reminder of our contriteness. It's a reminder that we seek God's forgiveness and that we will follow that seeking forgiveness throughout Lent by following Christ. So we mark ourselves as people who are on the path with Christ. So I will go first, and then once we complete that, then you can join in as Diana and does the ashes upon me.
ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And now join in. Ashes to ashes, dust to dust. So we thank you for joining with us in this ceremony. Please feel free to mark all of those that are with you wherever you are worshiping. Amen. And Christ invites you to this table, Christ's table today for communion. Come and join us for a meal before we begin our journey for 40 days. Come and join us and participate in the overflowing love, grace, and forgiveness of Christ to all that he invites to this table because all are welcome. So come, join with me. Gather together some bread and some juice or wine and let's gather together as we participate in this communion by intinction. Because on the night of his arrest, Jesus Christ invited the disciples for one last meal. And he took the bread and he blessed it. And then upon raising it, he broke it, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Whenever you eat of this, do so in remembrance of me. And after the meal, similarly, he took the cup and he said, This is the new covenant of the forgiveness of sins sealed in my blood. Whenever you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. So whenever we take this bread and whenever we take this cup, we again proclaim that Jesus Christ is our Lord and that he will come again. So I invite you to participate in our taking of communion today by intinction. Tear off a generous piece of bread because God is a generous God and dip it into the juice or the wine that you have to see and taste that God is good. And now, let's offer a prayer of thanksgiving. O oh Lord, we thank you for these gifts. We thank you for your invitation to come to your table and to dine with you and to experience with you that through the power of the Holy Spirit we are brought into your very presence. So as we prepare today on this Ash Wednesday to journey with you through Lent towards Jerusalem, may this meal nourish us. May it build our spirit that we may openly and honestly follow you and listen to your words and observe your actions and learn from you how we can best be disciples of you, followers of your way. Thank you. Amen. And I invite you, during this season of Lent, to participate in Lenten activities. We'll be posting daily devotionals on our website. So we urge you to go there and pick up those devotionals or go through any devotional that you may have. We invite you to make a concerted effort to pray every day, to pray as one following Jesus on these trails. We invite you to imagine yourself walking with Christ and the other disciples and other followers as he goes through his journeys. I invite you to read the Bible daily. It doesn't have to be this Lenten journey that you're reading, but I invite you to partake in God's Word on a daily basis. And any other Lenten practices that you may be thinking of adopting during this time. So you may be deciding to, as I said earlier, deny something yourself of something, but also during this Lenten practice, let's pick up something. Let's pick up a practice that helps bring us closer to God. And now, let me offer some blessings as we go on this road. Blessings for an unhurried life as we move forward. Because God formed us from the dust of the earth and brought us to new life in Christ. 
Through the waters of baptism, we are cleansed. We are made righteous. And here, during Lent, we are asked to change our hearts. As we journey through these 40 days of Lent, let our hearts be open to where Christ is leading, to what Christ is urging to put there. So help us to see Jesus in everyone that we meet and to serve him in all persons. Amen, and have a great journey.